Hey, this is Dave McCall, host of the QTS Experience podcast. And this week, I'm joined by a fascinating individual named Lior Netzer. If you've never heard of Lior, you can be forgiven. He's a behind-the-scenes guy, but he's essentially an internet magician. He worked for one of the founding content delivery networks called Akamai that helps bring the content that you and I love on a daily basis, whether it's Formula One racing, gaming, our favorite shows, essentially to us anywhere in the world. Lior helps to describe the history of the infrastructure, but in a way that's compelling, thought-provoking, and interesting. And also importantly, where are we going with all of this? I think you'll enjoy the conversation. I know I certainly did. So please join us for the conversation on the next QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. How we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Three, two, one. Lior Netzer, welcome to the QTS Experience. Thanks for having me, David. My great pleasure. So I've been talking to um, internet infrastructure people here lately because I'm a nerd and I love talking to folks like that F for two reasons. One, I want to get a little bit of your um, history and experience on how you built out. We're going to get to that in the conversation. But two, I talked to so many people, Lior, that have absolutely no idea how some of the back end stuff works on their you know devices no i just pick up my tablet and i watch stranger things and there we go and you know and and the magic happens and um i thought it would be a great conversation so we've been having a series of these to have people come on and talk about what is the magic how did the magic you know who are the magicians how did the how did the magic get um created um so with that in mind, I reached out to you. Thank you very much for coming on the show because you have so much experience in sort of the foundational infrastructure in delivering what we call content delivery if we're in the business or streaming if you're sort of casual uh, around that. What's a little bit of, can you explain to our audience a little bit of your background and history in building out some of that infrastructure? Sure, sure. So, uh by training, I'm a hardware engineer that focused in on networking. And, you know, over time, I, I developed some networking products. Uh, I then worked a little bit in security. And, you know, after a few years, I found myself uh, at Akamai, which is the leader in the content delivery network space and kind of invented the content delivery network space. And that is all about improving end users' experience um, as they look at content that is in a different place on the internet, and I'll talk about that in a second, mm -hmm. um, and getting it to them on sort of any device on any network uh, and in the best possible way. And, you know, through my years at Akamai, I, I did a variety of roles. I, I was VP of mobile networks, then, then I ran uh, the mobile business unit, uh, which I also started. And, you know, we did a lot of sort of content caching on devices, on, on phones themselves. Um, and then also IoT, Internet of Things, which is a, which is a whole other interesting area I could talk about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now very fortunate to work at Avid, which is the mostly around the content production. So before it's actually ready to be transported over the Internet, all the, you know, the phase is sort of from from camera to digital file, you could say, uh, as a rough approximation. Um, but if you like, David, I could maybe start by sort of zooming out on really what the Internet is and, and why we even do content delivery networks. And then maybe zoom all the way down to, to, con to caching on end devices or something like that. I think that's a great idea. Oh, OK, great. So. You know, without going to all the history of when the internet started and who gets credit for that, because there's multiple people who, who will claim that, um, you know, the, the internet is really a collection of networks. It's, it's a network of networks. There are anywhere from 30,000 to 60,000 networks out there, depending if you count sort of university and sort of private networks in there. The, the lower number, 30,000, is more the publicly available one, ISPs, and the, the other 30,000 roughly are, or if you add all the, you know, universities, you know, neighborhood networks, et cetera. And, you know, no single network, at least at least when I was in Akamai, delivered more than 2% of the internet. And there were mm -hmm. only 10 that delivered around 2%. And all the rest delivered much, much less. You know, in, in this sort of network of networks, you have backbones. They deliver the big chunks of, of, uh, of capacity. You could have, you know, AT&T, Sprint, um, Deutsche Telekom, um, Telecom Italia. You know, just, just, you know, those are some of those big names. There's, there's mm -hmm. others. And then you have access networks which are the ones that you buy your DSL from or you buy your fiber from. Some of the big backbones also offer the fiber. Some mm -hmm. of them only offer the access. And, you know, 
the thing about caching and content delivery is that when content moved to being hosted somewhere else, hosted meaning, meaning stored somewhere else and not on your end device, how do you get it through that mix of all these different networks and get it in a, in a high quality and consistent manner? It's not just about the quality, it's also about the consistency. And, and if you were to look at the internet, you know, between you and a server, you're typically going between 10 and 15 hops. A hop on the internet is, is you've got a router, which is a device that takes a lot of lines coming in, communications lines, and, and send it back out to a bunch of lines. And it makes the decision of what sort of piece of information called a packet comes in and, and, and where it goes to. And you know, it'll go between three and five networks and 10 to 15 hops. Um, that's a lot of steps along the way where something can go wrong. Can I ask you a quick clarifying question? So if I were to think of this, if I hop in my car, I have intersections, right? I've got, I come to a traffic light or whatever. Some traffic, some intersections. Um, so if I'm describing a journey, because that's what you're describing, this piece of information or my car is going on a journey. I'm starting at one spot. I'm going to another. And sometimes uh, I live in outside of Atlanta. I know you live in the greater Boston area. And so while the distance may be short because of my intersection experiences, you know, you guys love those things in Boston, which you're infecting the Southwest with is these uh, roundabouts. I don't know why anybody loves the roundabouts. It just, but anyway, whether it's a traffic light or a stop sign or a roundabout, I have, um, a different experience with these intersections and depending upon the volume of traffic, time of day, whatever, the time it may take me to get from Marlboro down to downtown Mass or Boston, it varies widely. Um, or in fact, sometimes I could maybe even drive over to Connecticut faster than I could to get 20 minutes, 20 miles away because of the number of intersections and the type of traffic. Is that what you're describing? Yeah, that's a great analogy, and, and you can think of the roads as the sort of as the pipes that right. connect the internet, um, which are usually you know fiber satellite, um, usually those two these days, mm -hmm. uh, mostly mostly the fiber, uh, and you can think of the junctions as the routers, because you go into a junction and, and you can leave in any one of different directions or a roundabout is is, a, is this advanced router, so that that's a perfect example, and obviously when you have a big highway you you can take a lot of traffic, when you have a narrow road you could get bottlenecked and different times of day have rush hour, just like the internet has rush hours. When mm -hmm. everybody is watching the Super Bowl, the internet is very loaded. <laughs> right. uh, world cricket, you know, you know, Olympics, et cetera. So, um, you know, the, the, the act of content delivery is really the balancing act of, of how to do that. You know, a, an interesting point people don't think about the internet is, you know, when you're <laughs> driving and, you know, you may drive 100 miles from Marlboro to Connecticut, depending where you're going, Connecticut, and mm -hmm. you may drive um, you know, 10 minutes to framing it. And it may take you the same amount of time. And, you know, while it takes you the same amount of time, it doesn't cost you the same. It still costs you a lot more gas and, and, and you know, a wear and tear on your car to drive to Connecticut. You have a, a higher cost to do that. On the internet, there is no cost component. It's kind of like if I was to mail a package to you and you're my next door neighbor, if I was to mail a package from here to Australia, imagine both of those would cost me the same. That's a cost model that I am not aware exists in anywhere else other than the model of communications. <laughs> and it's really interesting because it helped shape the dynamic of the internet in the sense that you can really pick any route, even if it goes around the world twice, you, you'll never pick something that goes around the world twice. Right. You can pick a path that's much longer. You don't really bear any more cost. Now, right. it's, it's not to say that the networks don't bear a cost. They do, you're using up their pipes. But you as the person with the content, you don't bear any additional cost. So really, really, this this world of content delivery is okay. I'm, I you know, we'll focus on streaming, which is part of content delivery. Is I'm watching something, I want to get this consistent bandwidth, but this internet keeps changing. It's like the traffic patterns keep changing many times from something unexpected. You know, the the internet in itself takes a while to correct. You know, it used to be that it took ten to fifteen minutes to correct on something major. It could take less to correct on something minor. What do you mean by is, it correct? What does that mean? It, it corrects. So all the routers. Um, send uh, routes to each other. They're called BGP, Border Gateway Protocol is the protocol. Mm -hmm. And they basically, they basically do what's called a ping. So they test the times it takes to get to other routers. They publish the routes they know on how to get from point A to point B to their next door neighbor. It's kind of an act of good citizenships, but they mm -hmm. all share it with one another. Very, very highly distributed, right? There's tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of routers on the internet today. 
And, you know, those BGP paths, they're kind of like driving directions in a sense. And, you know, you can get from any point A to B on the internet with practically an infinite amount of ways. If, mm -hmm. if you just think of the number of hops and on every hop you can make a multitude of decisions, do the power, do the math. You know, it's not truly infinity, it's an enormous number. Right. But they publish to each other the different routes and then each router makes a decision, oh, I'm gonna choose this route or this route. When something goes wrong, they have to converge on a new route. And that happens at one router and then the next and the next and the next. I'm, I'm, I'm roughly approximating. Yeah, that's somebody yeah. very technical listening to this, you wanna rip your hairs out now. <laughs> technically 100 percent accurate but by analogy it, it's kind of like that right? right in that convergence time you know it used to take 15 minutes 10 minutes now it can still take you know several minutes but hey for you watching you won't if, if it takes more than a few seconds you're going to notice it right so the the concept of content delivery is about bringing a local copy close to you so that you don't have to go through that whole journey to get your content so what a cache is is really it's a it's just a it's just a server that can store a piece of content close to you really at the end of the day and you know users go to what's called eyeball isps that's the isp that is the last connection you know that's where you know if you have fiber to your house or dsl you know it goes a few miles to what's called the central office and that central office connects to one of these locations which would be a data center and an eyeball isp and i and eyeball ISPs, you have them sort of at a city level. Mm -hmm. You could have multiple in a city, for example. Sometimes even at a neighborhood level, you could have this access point. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of bringing it there is there's much less chance of failure because it's already close to you. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, true, if that last mile, it's called the last mile because it literally is the last mile. If that last mile fails, um, you know, you're, you, you're gonna experience it. But the amount of last mile failures is very low. I mean, you know, if you think of the amount of actual outages when you can't get to anything, you know, it's pretty low these days, right? Right. Um, so the content delivery concept is about, hey, I'll bring a copy and I'll bring it close, but, you know, I can't copy everything on the internet to every location because the internet would explode because mm -hmm. there's so many zettabytes of, or, or exabytes of data out there. So the question is, how do you bring what's smart there so that, you know, in your limited storage, it's kind of like, if you think about it, it's kind of like, you know, if you have an e-commerce company and they have a giant warehouse, but they know that some items are really hot and popular, they may bring a selection of, of hey, your supermarket's a great example. You know, a supermarket will have anywhere from 4,000 to 30,000 SKUs. It's not everything you could possibly buy on the planet, but right. it's the most likely things you'll want to buy and you'll be able to access them in your neighborhood. You know, if you want something a little more special, you'll have to, you know, mail order it or drive somewhere further. So think about, about a CDN, you know, you can only store You've got your limited shelf space, which is your storage space, and that's what you put there. And, you know, lots of companies have done research, and in the end, at, at, uh, for a rough approximation, really the best way to do that is just demand-based. So whatever people are requesting, you bring it in the first time uh, from the origin, and then you just store a local copy so that the number two, number three, number four, number five, and so on person requesting it will just get it locally. And hey, you're gonna put a timer on it. If nobody's asked for it for two days, you're gonna allow it to be overwritten because it must not be of, of, of use anymore. And, and you know, so you know, some things that stay for a long time could be a new release of a movie that people are gonna watch now for the next few months. And items that stay for a short time could be a news story on a local station, you know, relevant for some random Tuesday. And you know, the likelihood of somebody watching that story on a Thursday is, is, is quite low. I think what you're saying is when the Mandalorian is released, everybody's watching it, but probably my interest in watching Tom Cruise and cocktail from 1988 is not going to linger on the local hard drive that long. Exactly. All that's right. Good example. That, that yeah. explains exactly. a lot. <laughs> yes. So that's why you have to make up to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so when, you know, the, the good question is like, what, why would you even want to cash? So you want to cash, when you have this sort of um, kind of like sand clock, you think of, of how a sand clock is shaped, right? You have a lot of sand coming in. That's all the content in the world. Mm -hmm. And every company hosts content in different places, right? You know, Facebook may have, they used to have four data centers. I don't know how many they have now. And, you know, um, other companies will, will have an X amount. And even the ones that have a large amount will have usually no more than several than a dozen or two, unless you're, mm -hmm. unless you're one of a handful of companies that have hundreds. So you've got this big funnel on the top. Then you have this narrow waist, which is all those 
you know, three to five networks, 15 hops, that's the narrow waist of the internet. And then you have a ton of capacity on the last mile. In fact, you know, I don't have recent numbers, but if I were to, to you know, there's somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times more capacity in the last mile than in the narrow waist. There's really? a ton. People are now getting a gigabit to their home. Right. You know, I have 200 megabits because I, I don't figure I need more, but right. that, I, I'm behind. And with the new infrastructure bill where they're talking about bringing fiber to everybody's home and then it's just a, a scale of optics as they upgrade, it's tre tremendous. It's tremendous, right? And fiber has, for all intents and purposes, infinite capacity, right? right. It just depends on what you put. So, so you have this, you know, thousand, hundred to a thousand ratio here to one to maybe to maybe five to ten. That, that those are rough numbers. So like mm -hmm. five to ten to one to like a thousand is, is mm -hmm. an approximation. So the reason you want to do that is when you is to get the content beyond that narrow waist. So you get it through that through that bottleneck one. So it, it may not be a bottleneck um, mm -hmm. most of the time. It may only be a bottleneck five or ten percent of the time. But hey. Rush hour is only 10% of the time, and it still bothers all of us because right. it tends to be at times when a lot of people want to watch it. And then you just store it in that in that wide area where where you don't have to use resources around that that uh, bottleneck in the uh, sand clock. How how did this concept um, not not so much how did the concept come to be because we've seen concepts like this for probably millennia to one degree or the other. Uh, whether it's moving crops or people or whatever, but to to build that initial infrastructure to lay that out was that a great collaboration? Was it a happy accident? How did that come about? Um, so I mean, so you know, the the internet kind of has a really interesting story. You know, started through universities and ARPANET, um, and and you know, starting opening um, themselves to each other, so researchers could communicate, and then mm -hmm. companies got added to the mix, and and you know, and then commercial companies got added. But you know, for for CDNs, it was private companies that decided to basically put their servers in several networks um, through a paid model where there's a benefit to the network and, and there's a benefit to, to the content provider, which kind of funds it. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's interesting, if you, are a, if you are an access ISP, you know, the one where all the I, you know, last mile connections come mm -hmm. into and you need to be serving that, you know, episode of uh, that movie, uh, the Tom Cruise movie you talked mm -hmm. about, <laughs> you know, you get a benefit by having a caching server there because a lot of your cost is you're paying somebody for that big pipe coming into your ISP, internet mm -hmm. service provider. You're paying somebody for that pipe. Mm. And hey, if I put a cache in there, I've just hey, you only pay for it once. The next ten thousand times it's asked for, you don't pay for it. Right. So a lot of those will actually let you put those in for free, because mm. what do they have to do? They have to give you a bit of rack space and a bit of power. Um, but on the other hand, they get all this huge saving, and hey, they perform better than their competitor. Um, and, and if you're a big powerhouse, you know one of the big biggest networks, you may you may charge for it because you can't. So, you know, you get all those interesting dynamics as well in there, but, but it does, it does benefit when, when content flows smoothly, it benefits everybody. How, besides the obvious of the network, um, that waste that you described and that, that choke point, it feels like, for example, just using my traffic metaphor in my, and we live in a part of town where there's a lot of expansion going on and you can tell the difference between not so, of course they've widened some of the roads but what they've gotten really good at is the way that they move the traffic signals in other words the way they've optimized how you move through the area because they can't just keep stacking roads we're in a we're in a suburban area etc and one of the things that has always fascinated me and i have no idea how the voodoo works is how i can take so originally with content delivery it was to my computer, it was to a desktop, and then to a laptop, and eventually to mobile devices, I literally can go to a soccer field or whatever um, remotely on a 4G at most usually signal and watch in beautiful glory a streaming uh, movie or TV or something and have an amazing, I don't know if it'd be immersive, but an amazing experience because it feels like they've optimized not just the routes that you were talking about before with all the routers, but just that the way that the content, um, you know, whether for lack of a better word, I'm speaking ignorantly, but the algorithms or whatever to make sure that when when you get it, 
I'm going to deliver you this gorgeous, multicolored, in-depth experience, but I'm going to use a fraction of the bandwidth I used to need. Right. So that's a really interesting sort of analogy. So I talked about that very vast, you know, a thousand X compared to the choke point mm -hmm. um, availability on fixed line networks where you get, you know, a, a cable coming to your house. ultimately. Right. Whether, whether you use inside the house, whether you use Wi-Fi or not, a little less right. relevant. The thing is you get a physical cable to your house. Right. In, in mobile, in cellular, actually, there's another narrow way. So mm. actually, you know, it used to be in the 2G, 3G days, that was narrower than the internet sort of choke point. You know, now it's maybe, you know, similar, a little bigger, a little smaller, depending what you're on. But the it's not really an almost unlimited last mile on cellular. So what they've really had to do is figure out how to sort of time slice, time share, beam form. There's a whole collection of technologies so that you get your experience. Now, you know, a little trick, you're on your phone. So, you know, a typical HD broadcast would be anywhere from five to 20 megabits, you know, to your home, if it was, mm -hmm. you know, on a big screen TV, depending if you're HDR or not HDR, 1080p, 720p, you know, there's 2K, 4K, et cetera, you know, 4K would be, you know, maybe, you know, 20 to 50 megabits. Um, on your phone, they can actually reduce it a lot without you noticing because, you know, the screen's much smaller and your, mm -hmm. you know, your eye can only tell up to a tenth of a millimeter. So, you know, you, you could do pretty well with like two megabits. So that's mm -hmm. that's kind of trick number one. You don't mm -hmm. need the five to 20. You can go, go maybe down to any number I'm throwing is a range. I'm just giving kind of right. numbers. You know, it would be, say, you know, one, two megabits. The other thing they do is 4G, as you mentioned. So 4G, kind of the Gs in, in cellular, this is really interesting. It's not like they're not very discreetly defined. They sort of overlap each other. And a G in, in the cellular world is really the latest collection of tricks that I'm going to bundle together and call them a G. So <laughs> you kind of start accumulating tricks and technology. And when they hit a critical mass, you say, okay, I'm going to call that a new G. G stands for generation. Right. So 3G was the third generation, right? In 3G, you could go up to 14 megabits. You know, 4G, also long known as LTE, long-term evolution, because at the time they thought this is where it's going to end up. Of course, not realizing, well, they did think about 5G, 6G, but it seemed, you know, right. very science fiction. You know, that can go anywhere from, you know, 10 megabits, because they overlap sometimes to a few hundred megabits. And then 5G overlaps into 4G. So some providers, 4G is as good as others, 5G. There's a lot of marketing games that are being played there is the next one. So... They've gotten that, you know, 10, 20 times more than 3G. And then, so they, they, they reduce the size of the video. They've brought more bandwidth. Uh, sometimes they'll have Wi-Fi in the stadiums, which is, you know, using another uh, method to access in parallel. Um, and they do other tricks like, like beam forming. So beam forming is where a, an antenna of a, of a cell phone for one millisecond, one one thousandth of a second, they'll give you all the capacity and they'll just burst everything you need for the next second in that one thousandth of a second, then next, move to the person next to you, the person next to you. So they use all these combinations of tricks and, and there's others, there's right. multiple frequencies, there, there's a bunch of others. And they've really nailed that down to be, you know, a, the good experience. But, you know, at the end of the day, everybody in the stadium really, you know, opened their phone and tried to watch. I don't know if there's one stadium I can think of that may be able to handle that, but normally most stadiums will not. So it's right. still predicated on the fact that it's one out of five, one out of 10, one out of, you know, something like that. Sorry for the long winded explanation. But no, it, that's perfect. It, it's, it's such a, such a, I mean, there's so many things that go into play to really get, give you that experience at the end of the day. How, how do you, you know, as you were walking us through that, I'm trying to imagine how do you um, innovate in that space? And just what I mean, sort of like when we were talking about 3G or 4G, you know, uh, I heard a philosopher once say, <clears throat> it might have even been in Rolling Stone magazine, I don't remember, every generation thinks they invented sex and rebellion. You know, they, we got this old people, you know, and if you, you just go back a generation, you know, they were, they thought they invented or whatever it was, they're either pushing guardrails or, or decreasing guardrails. And so it, it's this idea of, in, of innovating, um, you know, I, I'm imagining Sir Isaac Newton or Galileo or whoever, scientists in the past, if they looked at something like this, it would be magic, like the depth of colors, all of the whatever. So somebody's imagination had to come up with it. 
you know, in some science fiction book or whatever, but we have this imagination and then a group of people have to come together and say, but, but is it really just imaginary? And then how do we invent the underlying infrastructure to deliver on our imagination? How does that work? You've been part of that world. How does that, how do people come th together to talk about what's possible that we can afford, that the science is for, that we, we innovate in this space? Right. So oh, I could talk hours on that one. And it's, it's why I love high tech and technology, because it gives you a chance to really, uh, you know, make products out of inventions and make a living out of liking to invent things. So, right. so I really love that part. I, I would say, you know, it's, it's a combination of factors. Um, first of all, it's a lot of tenacity and persistence because, you know, like Thomas Edison said, um, genius is uh, 99, 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, you need, you need a lot of tenacity and a lot more things fail than succeed. Um, you know, Edison, when he did the filament, um, I can't remember if it was 300 or 3000 or somewhere in between those two mm -hmm. numbers, but that is the number of filaments he tried until he, you know, hit the final one, which initially was, was cotton. And then, you know, today is usually tungsten, which is a, which is a metal that can withstand really high temperatures. So, right. so he, can you imagine trying 300 to 3,000 somewhere in that range filaments, and until you get it right? I mean, most people would, would give up, you know, way along the journey. You know, way most early people the 150 years ago would give up. Today, they wouldn't even start. Like, like we're just so uh, attention starved. We wouldn't even start. Exactly. So I would say, you know, it's that. There's <clears throat> ideas that always come from academia and research, which you know are, are forward looking. Of hey. Mathematically, I can show this, you know, can I implement this? And, and they, you know, those people graduate and get into the industry. And a lot of, you know, companies, um, you know, work with them, whether it's entrepreneurs starting new companies who look for, you know, an idea in academia that could be turned into a commercial product or, or big companies which have, say, intern programs with universities or have advisory boards with universities or, uh, you know, where I worked before Akamai, you know, we, we did a ton of hiring from MIT Mm -hmm. uh, because we wanted sort of that caliber and that that level of inventiveness. And, and there were hundreds of people uh, from MIT sort of working at Akamai. Um, and then there's a lot of cross-pollination happening. So you say, hey, this technology really works for one world, but hey, could I apply it for the cellular world? Mm. And, you know, so for example, if you think about it, the whole notion of packets and queuing delivery, I mean, that's, that's thousands of years old if you look at the world of shipping. You know, how yeah. did they figure out how to ship when they did containers and they needed to load an enormous cargo ship that can store 2000 containers what order do you put them on so that you can take them off the fastest way and they get to their end point so algorithms like that are parts of those are in today's networking algorithms and they started from things like shipping and just just to name sort of one example and so you get it kind of coming from all directions and then you do a lot of experimentation and you usually um, there's a model that, that one of my current sort of uh, partners slash customers uses called the five P's, um, which is um, re really um, sort of planning, proof of concept, prototyping, piloting, and production. Mm. And, you know, what, what that means is, is, you know, planning is the ideation, proof of concept, hey, you show it can be done. It, it doesn't work in a commercial manner, but hey, at least it doesn't not work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, then prototype is you actually get a first customer to, to work and use it. Pilot is, is where you actually have somebody use it in production, in early production. They actually use it in a commercial way. And then, you know, full production is where you make it repeatable. So there's many models of that nature, you know, but that's kind of an interesting one um, to see. So it's a kind of a melting pot of all of those things together. You've got to be willing to experiment. You've got to be willing to try and you've got to be willing to fail and get up again and again and again. And, you know, until you get it right. And until you find a business model that you want to turn into a product. And, and a ton of things fail, even though technolo technologically they succeed because they just don't have a business model that supports it. One of the things I think that's really interesting that you said that I, I don't, I certainly hadn't considered and a lot of people not around the telecom, um, especially the content delivery space is this idea of there's an impact and you can infer um, cost in, in the time. In other words, in your analogy of it costs the same to ship it next door as it does to Australia, but there may be an opportunity cost if I have to wait for it to go all the way to Sydney and back or whatever. But other than that, this idea that really doesn't exist in anything else yet that comes to mind or that we can think of, I'm sure it's somebody on the interwebs will um, point out the, the one that we missed, 
that's a that's a remarkable idea and it seems like it provides fertile ground for experimentation hey what if we if this one cost that's traditional in any industry is removed we have other costs and you know restrictions or whatever but if we could remove this one what could we do with that and how and and the the possibilities are you know amazing as we've seen right no and and, and actually you know i once took this course called systematic inventive thinking and what what they did is this israeli company and, and they go and they look at can i find a common denominator in how things were invented mm. and they walk you through five or ten you know different models and one of them is called removal and removal is i'm going to just remove one constraint now and mm. now see what happens and then and then there's others and 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 that you know that example you gave is a really interesting one and you know the interesting thing about the internet is really where money changes hands is is almost only where one network peers with another network. Peers means it's connected. Mm. And they come to an agreement, hey, every packet I move from me to you, you know, I pay you so much because I'm using you to move that packet to the next phase. And every packet you move to me, you pay me so much. And you can imagine if you're a gorilla here and you're a small company here, you're mm -hmm. going to be doing most of the paying. And if it's the <laughs> other way around, it's the other way around. Right. But it's those collections of you know, if you look at all the permutations, tens of thousands of different agreements, that's what's going on behind the scenes in the internet. So yeah. when, when you know, you're doing that, um, you know, FaceTime or WhatsApp video or whatever you're using with, you know, a friend of yours in Australia, and it's passing through those five networks, they're each paying each other something. And well, somehow it makes the economic model work in the end. Well, I'm I'm, I'm writing down notes because I'm going to have to cut. I know we we have to stop at the top of the hour because uh, there are ideas already that you're um, that I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole because I've got another um, thread for you. But can, just imagine the complexity of getting back to your shipping model, the the necessary negotiations to get everybody to agree, for example, in a modern example, what that container looks like. Not, not just the logistics of how you put it on a ship, but docking infrastructure around the world has to be able to receive, onload, offload. There has to be some commonality. I was reminded of this um, in watching uh, YouTube videos of pilots that fly around the world. And the universal language for most international pilots is English. They have to pass an English proficiency test because the folks in Cairo and London and Istanbul, and Rio, and uh, New York City, that's the language that they've agreed upon because that was the common language at the time. And, it, and it's fascinating to just see, and I'm sure there are stories there about, you know, the, the power and control that comes, whether it's language or whatever the standard is, internet packet, whatever, who controls that, how does that work, how does that agree agreed upon? is its own science and I'm certain interesting story in and of itself. It, it, it is and very relevant to the internet. So um, it is exactly a combination of people who come in agreement and vendors who have dominance who, who kind of push their way through or, or re really lean in heavily. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of standards committees for the internet. Um, you know, one's, one's the IEEE. Um, you know, um, uh, one for, for mobile, for example, it's the 3GPP Association. Uh, and, there, and there's a few others. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of nerds come and meet together a few times a year and they bring up ideas and some of them get voted in. Um, it starts as a, you know, request for comment and ultimately becomes like a standard that they all agree to. Uh, vendors also come in and talk there and explain why they want things a certain way versus another way. And at the end of the day, they do become these standards and standardization, as you said, is, is huge. Right. Um, and there's standards around everything. So the, the protocol, everybody's heard of TCP IP, uh, mm -hmm. transmission control protocol over internet protocol. That's the most common one on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's heard about HTTP, which is the language, you know, you talk with web browsers. Everybody's heard of HTML, which is a language inside the web browser. So whether you're using, you know, Chrome or Safari or, or, or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. if it comes in HTML over HTTP, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can view it um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, the, you know, the, there were definitely kind of competing standards at different parts of the journey mm -hmm. uh, until they really got, um, you know, initially it was called ARPANET before it was TCP IP. Um, but now now the standards are, are really good for sort of everybody, because the last thing you want to worry about is that the networks or the devices won't support the way you're working, right? 
So every yeah. router today, every computer knows what to do with TCP IP. And every phone knows how to work on 3G, 4G, 5G, whatever you're using. So if, if you're in the belly of the beast building out this infrastructure and your, um, your experience is teaching you how to innovate better and to do all of these other things, what captures your imagination to say, hmm, I want to take my experience and I want to apply it and try it still in content delivery, but in a different place in the order. I know, um, and while this is an infomercial for our companies, I, I know you moved on. Uh, Akamai is a wonderful company, but you said, hmm, I want to try something a little bit different to leverage it. W what caught your imagination and what is it that you're doing now that you think is valuable? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So. You know, I, I was very fortunate to join Akamai at a time where the internet was really transforming and becoming <coughs> mainstream. You know, it, when I joined in 99, you know, it was still dial-up modems and, and, you know, everything was sort of really slow to load on the page. And, yeah. you know, five years and everybody, you know, was, was dialing into an ISP. And five years later, you know, at least in, in some places, everybody has this fast DSL connection. Right. And the internet is not instant, but much closer to instant. And you can suddenly watch videos on the internet, which was just a you know, crazy idea before that you could only do in very specific locations. And, you know, the compute moved from sort of desktop compute where you download something and install to cloud compute where, you know, we use cloud so much today, you know, my kids, they don't even, they ask me what cloud is and they tell right. me cloud is what you do all day long. Every <laughs> time right. you go to Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you're on the cloud, right? right. You, you don't even know where the computing's happening on, on your phone or, or in the cloud. But, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be in that transition when the internet moved to that model. And, you know, in the media production, post-production, the world I'm in now, that world is now at that inflection point. Mm. Some parts of it are in the middle of the inflection point, some parts at the beginning. And, you know, they're just moving to the internet, which is, which to me is, is a, is a chance to sort of repeat that journey, but also be more experienced and have learnings from, from how it was in the past. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, I'll give you some examples, you know, news stations today around the world, most of their gear is still on premise. So it's, right. it's actual machines that sit in physical newsrooms and, you know, everybody's working and, and logging into those machines, sometimes from remote, but, but into those machines. And, you know, only a handful of them are in the cloud. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons, historical reasons, security reasons, you know, they're, they're afraid of being, being hacked, of, you know, connectivity reasons, is the internet reliable enough? But it's now starting to move. Mm -hmm. You know, editing for movies, a lot of that still happens on physical machines and editing suites. Mm -hmm. You know, that's now moving to the cloud. And it's moving to the cloud, but it's less of a naive journey because 20 years ago when it moved to the cloud, there was no cloud. Cloud was being invented as it moved right. into it, it moved into this thing that was being invented as things moved into it. Right. Now it exists and it's defined, and you have a lot of you know public cloud companies that offer you as much, you know, with a press of a button and a credit card, so you can get as much compute as you need anywhere in the world almost. Right. So you get to do it in a in a much more mature way. And and I find that, you know, really fascinating, really interesting, and, and a real opportunity for growth. You as you were talking, it reminded me of a couple things, and then I have a question. Um, which this question usually comes up when we're talking about technology. But the, but the, what it reminded me of <clears throat> is when I go to church, I see so many church organizations, whether they're um, evangelical or temple or mosque or whatever, where they collaborate together to make content. They take, you know, they've got a common, it may be, di you know, it may be disseminated differently in, in their particular um, congregation, but people of, you know, of various belief systems, they come together and they leverage each other now. This is a fascinating concept to me where they leverage tools so that they can help that local congregation, whatever the sermon is. And I'm sure this is not just churches, but it just struck me as so surprised, in particular in worship services, where I've seen that happen. That just blew my mind. And why not? Why not leverage technology to deliver an experience that, um, you know, people have already sort of settled on a particular belief idea, and this is whether it's a teaching or a way to worship or whatever. I, I don't know why it never occurred to me. It blew my mind. The second thing, and you, met, you it struck me that when you were talking about the news, I find myself pretty regularly hitting YouTube to see what's the weather today. My local weather channel will have posted a 90-second or 30-second 
before I even go to, because it may not be weather time on the TV. And But then I thought, what about the security? What if somebody, for lack of a better description, deep fakes that and says, hey, here's you know something benign as weather. Hey, it's going to be calm today. And I take my boat out onto the lake, which I do on occasion, or whatever. I'm taking my kids out or I drop them off at the park and I head over here only to find out that that is not true. Not because they made a mistake, but because somebody change the content and um and we, we there's all this sensitivity around fake news and whatever H- how do you protect um how in your world or do you have any do you have any role in that at all or um to help people as they're producing their content to make sure it's distributed with integrity yeah no so absolutely yeah security is really up there it's kind of table stakes um for what we do so I mean, first of all, when you're connecting to, so, you know, YouTube is an example where really it's very hard to control that. I would say typically sure. if somebody really did deep fake it and it's, a, it's an article of relevance, somebody after a while would flag it to YouTube and, and sure. somebody at YouTube would remove it. Right. Um, you know, I, I heard once somebody did an experiment in Wikipedia, they, they changed some uh, entries and wanted to see how long till Wikipedia discovered it. And it was less than 45 minutes every time on just random sure. entries on Wikipedia because you have enough viewership that they that they flag it. So so YouTube is sort of one instance. But regarding if you're going to your you know your local you know provider your right. your, your your K provider and provider um, and logging <laughs> in, then first of all that connection is secure. You know, secondly, our systems offer security every level of the way. The way you connect with the news server, the way the news server writes content to the disk. The content on the disk many times is encrypted itself. Its security is always uh, is always rings and rings of security. It's, it's sort of not one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know it is absolutely a key component. And, and more and more as as news moves to the cloud. Um, but but you did hit an interesting point that actually the the brand damage and tarnishing is a lot more worrisome than actually spoofing a specific news article. Sure. Because that specific news article has a very short lifespan. It, right. It's you know it's it's relevant for today and usually gone a few hours later, um, but the brand tarnishing can linger on. So 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 they are very everybody's really concerned about that and and there's several security measures along the way. Well, we are about out of time. Normally we, I, I you know, my producer said, look, you've got to limit it to this time. I'm like, I've got a hundred. This is a you know architect genius. I've got five hundred things to talk about. So I'm, we're going to respect the time. I know you've got. First of all, thank you for joining me today. When we come back next, when you've got a little bit more time, a little bit later in the year, and you come back next, what should we talk about? How would you shape the conversation, McCall? You asked these things, but what you really should have asked about is this, and that's a fascinating hour. What would it be? Oh, great question. So I'll need to work with you on that. <laughs> well, what captures your imagination? What is it that you and your team are super stoked to talk about? Yeah, so um, so it's a, it's a lot of different things, I would say. But, you know, convergence of worlds is a really interesting one. So mm. to the point where we ended this, you know, how does the world of cloud look in the world of media production, news, music production, you know, half a year from now, nine months from now, compared to when we talked back in February? Right. <laughs> When we come to that, that that could be one topic. Yeah. Um, you know, the world of mobile is always one that that I'm always passionate about, and you know, it'll be interesting to see what new experiences are available on mobile by then. Um, yeah. And you, know, they're all connected, right? Because yeah. it's it's all it's all about the journey from the camera or or from the from the completely digital journey today. More and more happening, right? A lot of movies today. You know, you mentioned Mandalorian. They're shot in virtual studios. Yeah. There's actually nobody goes to the desert to film that. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a huge dome um, that you can project things on the walls and there's LED screens and you can add things after um, that make it look so real. That that's an interesting world in itself and in, in how that's done. And you know that journey from from that camera or computer until you actually consume it on your end device. I, I find I find interest in all paths along the journey. To be honest with you, one of my guests that's coming to, into the studio in the next day or so to record is a former producer for Marvel. Lives here in Atlanta. He's a writer for Wired and Rotten Tomatoes. I have a list of questions for him, but one of the things we always come back to is how is the how is the world of tech, whether it's AR, VR, AI, that metadata, or even as simple as three D printing 
set props because because what they'll do one of the things i've learned recently is they'll create that dome or other things high def tvs all the way around makes it even easier for actors as they're acting instead of just against the green screen and they'll place a physical prop or two and they may have 3d printed that right over there in the warehouse it's unbelievable how cool it is i i agree super well, Lior, I know you need to go. Thank you very much for joining us on the QTS experience. And we will have links to you and your organization down below. Thanks for joining us today. I look forward to our next conversation. Great. Same here. Thanks, David.